All right, you guys, episode five of Alone Frozen. They are calling this one Outfoxed, and I often come up with my own name for the episodes, but Outfoxed is perfect. That said, I want to share at the outset, before misunderstanding can go any further, that the fox did not lose its own foot when I just missed trapping it. I say, oh, look, it left a foot behind. Not the fox's foot. It was the hare's foot. I would have been so horrified if it had been that fox's own foot. And if I had known that I had desperately injured this creature, I would not have been nonchalant. So I am saying that right off the bat before I even talk about the things I'm going to talk about in this review. As you will see, it is getting dark earlier and earlier, and I no longer have time to watch the episode and film my review all in the daylight hours if I'm trying to do it in one day. So I am trying out my indoor filming area, and I know it's not quite as dynamic as the lovely backdrops I try to choose, but work with me. Hopefully the content will be interesting enough. So on this episode, we see a lot of big things going on, some people really struggling, someone making that hard call yet again, I know, I know, people are going home really early, you guys. Wow, this season, right? So intense. So of course I'm going to be talking about the things you're seeing in this episode. I'm going to be going into details of my shelter and the parts of the construction that you can see revealed in this episode. It's come a long way since those first couple episodes when it was really, really not working super well. I'm also going to be going into what we hear both Amos and Michelle talking about in terms of the long-term effects of going out on a loan and some of the ways those affect people. I'm going to be talking about the hair loss that Amos mentions. Because there are so many fewer of us out there on this season, we're hearing a lot more of the philosophy and the depth of the folks out there. And I love this season for that. I love that they talked about one of my primary philosophies, and that is reminding people that we come from the wild. Our ancestors lived and thrived out in the wild places, and all of those genes are in us too. And my ancestors did not see themselves as separate from nature. They were part of nature and they were part of all of those natural rhythms. And so being out there, that's so important to me, just recognizing that I am part of those too. I believe I said I'm no less wild than a wild fox that's never seen a person before. I wouldn't say that's totally accurate. Obviously, being modern people, we are a bit less wild, right? We are used to having a lot of our needs taken care of without a lot of effort. But the idea that we too are wild is an important and a primary one for me. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the notifications bell. And please consider supporting me on Patreon. It is my main funding source for being able to keep this channel afloat. And there's also all kinds of wonderful benefits to being a Patreon member, including getting to have live talks with me about Alone Fruit. We had an amazing one this week. It was so much fun. I actually had someone make a comment on my YouTube channel last week about how offended they were at the idea that I shared that if I am coming from a place of heart and connection, animals are more likely to offer themselves to me. And the idea that they are offering themselves rather than me taking was offensive to them. And I can understand that. It's, there's definitely a level of anthropomorphizing in there and assuming that we have an idea of the animal's intention. That said, I think that it's absolutely true, even if you just look at it from a logical place, that when we are more in tune with our environment, when we're coming to it from a place of respect and love rather than a place of taking and domination, that's going to be reflected in our bearing. We're going to be probably moving quieter on the land, paying more attention, looking around, being more like a wild creature out there, which is going to set the animals more at ease. And it's going to mean that they are more likely to come around and give us opportunity at them. So I don't mean the animal is literally choosing death and lying down on the rocks in front of one, but I do think that there's a difference between going out and having a really hard time even seeing game or seeing sign of game and going out and having an animal present itself in a way that gives you a good shot. That does not always happen. So I do believe that there's something deeper at play when that does happen and that it's a sign of you being a little bit more connected and present in the present moment which is a great segue to talking about that fox. Now, as you can see, looking at my footage, 
this place was so sparse. It was mostly barren rock with a bit of lichen, some very scattered trees without needles, extremely sparse in game and very difficult to track. Basically, there's no tracking over bare rock. So that means that there would have been no way for me to know that there was a fox in the area and know where would be a good area to set up traps. However, one night early on, and you can hear me saying the fox returned in this episode, the first time was in the night. I was in my sleeping bag in the shelter, dead asleep, and I heard a noise outside that was a metallic noise. It was my pot that I had left outside full of water cooling to be ready to drink for the next morning after boiling it, sitting outside on the rock. Now, I got up that night too to see what was out there moving my pot, and the pot was knocked over and it had been full of water. So it was heavy. So it was not a small creature like a squirrel or something that could have knocked that over, nor even a weasel. Plus it was at night and it's only a few animals that are so curious and so bold as to come into a camp full of strange smells and nose around and push something over like that. So I thought to myself, Thinking of all the things out here that could do that, I really feel like that was a fox and that is a total fox behavior. But I still wouldn't have known for sure, except that about a week later, the night that you're seeing in this episode, again, I'm asleep in my bed in the middle of the night and now I hear footsteps on my shelter. Now at this point I had a lot of insulation and a lot of insulation on top. We're going to talk about that soon. So that the shelter looked like a continuation of the rock itself. You couldn't really see that it was a tarp because the rock and then my whole tarp were covered in lichen. So the fox was out on the roof and then it saw a part where it was just plastic on the side there and it dug at it very loudly and then I thought okay now I know that it's a fox because I saw a fox scratching at the tarp in my shelter in Alone season six as well. So knew it was a fox behavior. Sure enough the next morning I went up on top of the shelter after you see me talking about it and there was a fresh fox poop right on top of the shelter right there. That's a thing foxes do. They poop in prominent areas to let you know they've been there. So out of this whole landscape, I would never have known that there was a fox around except it kept coming to my shelter and announcing itself and announcing itself more and more boldly. So I felt like that was an invitation to set a trap for that fox. I didn't go looking for it. It came to me and it kept doing it until I really paid attention and I said, okay, I'm going to make a baited trap. Well, I don't remember how many nights, not many after setting that. Sure enough, again, I wake up in the night and this was pre-dawn, a little bit of light was coming to a noise. And I poked my head out. I was unable to find my headlamp. So I poked my head out and I could see the fox jumping around and I thought, okay, what do I do? Do I approach the fox, which will probably scare the heck out of it. And if there's any way it can bolt, it probably will bolt. Or do I stay inside out of view and let it die peacefully and then go and get it? And so that's what I chose to do. But then it was so devastating when I went back out, listened for it to be all quiet, assuming the fox had probably died. And instead I went out and it was gone and my snare loop was gone too. So this is where I say it left a foot. It left part of the bait that I had in that cubby trap, not its own foot. And it's misleading because you can see it looks a little bit orange. It looks orange and white, but hair feet are dyed brown on the bottom, not the top, but brown. And it's kind of orangey looking too. And it's because of the, the dirt that they're stepping in and the tannins of the fallen leaves and needles and that kind of thing. So hair feet are white on top, but orangey brown on the bottom. So it kind of looks like a fox's foot, but it is not. It is that hair foot. I would have been so devastated. Otherwise it would have been written all over me and my demeanor. You would have really seen the anguish. I still had anguish knowing that this poor fox had to break its way out of the trap, but because the wire was clean gone, it seemed clear that it had thrashed around so much to undo my coiling of the wires as opposed to breaking it. And so that made it seem like it was less likely a major injury. It was more that it eventually worked it free. We then go to Callie talking about how she is ready for fish. She's making a fish trap, which was brilliant. That was an awesome design. I might've had the sticks come a little bit 
closer together because that one was only set up to be able to catch pretty big fish. That said, great idea, well executed, and we see in a later scene where she's on Seal Rock having a really hard time, a white floating thing in the background. I'm guessing that that's a float that she used to mark her trap. Not sure, but it seems very clearly in the area that she's using a lot, so that's going to be my guess. Curious to hear from Callie. Hopefully she'll join us for a Zoom call at some point. Really loved her fish dance out there. Callie is an awesome example of how positive attitude makes such a difference. She's obviously struggling. She's obviously very hungry. She's obviously losing a lot of weight. You can really see it in her face. She's starting to have belly issues, but keeping herself positive with silly little dances, that's huge. It's absolutely a survival skill. So let's talk about the Storm Fortress. I'm glad they showed the name. I had a name for my cabin in season six too. It was Spruce Grouse Cottage, but they never showed that. But the Storm Fortress was a serious edifice, you guys. There was so much dirt and rock and wire and wood built into that sucker. Oh my goodness, heaps of sod, heaps of lichen and moss. What they don't show in that first episode when I'm choosing the site, I was choosing that big stone background as a really great block to the wind. It was all of my north side and a good chunk of my east side, which was absolutely the direction that the prevailing winds came from. So that was awesome. But the other thing about building into a corner of stone was planning from the outset that I wanted a chimney 100% because I never got a chimney on season six and it was a massive handicap because it meant that my shelter was never fully steeled so I couldn't get it as warm in there as I wanted to. But I knew that a corner of rock meant that I only had to build the other side of that chimney and that it would be fully supported by solid rock as I built up, which is huge. I knew that was going to be a tremendous advantage. So I was really excited to finally get to the point where the rest of it was built up enough that the weather wasn't just pouring in and I could put my energy towards a chimney. A really important point was that I prioritized building the chimney early on Frozen because not building it early enough on season six really came back to bite me. I put a ton of energy into hauling rocks. I found one spot of clay pretty late in my time there and hauled it up and I had a whole plan for building up a clay and stone chimney, but it just got way too cold too fast. And so that clay was rock solid. And I knew that if I built with it, even if I could thaw it, it was going to freeze before it could possibly dry. And the ice crystals in there would just bust it all apart and destroy it. So I lost my opportunity to build a chimney on season six because it got so darn cold so fast. Now, Labrador was incredibly brutal, incredibly hard weather, but as you can see by the temperatures, it was hovering around freezing. It wasn't way below freezing right away, which meant I still was able to work with somewhat liquid clayey soil. It wasn't really clay, but it was, it had clay-like properties to it. So building that chimney as soon as I had the opportunity was key for me and it worked out great. I had to haul those rocks. You can see me down on the beach hauling a big rock up. That was, I believe, my mantle rock, which was a very specific one I was looking for, but it was so much effort hauling those rocks up. My shelter was hundreds of feet up cliffs above the shoreline down there. So tons of effort to haul those all up, but it was amazing having that. And you can see as I'm building it, a little ring of wire. What I did was with that big mantelpiece stone, I did loops of snare wire around it and then made a twist so that I had a nice little ring right in the middle of that mantle. And I had to put that in ahead of time because there'd be no way for me to get it up and around after the rest of it was built. So I built that specifically as a place to hang my cooking pot. So I had a loop there and then a hook on the handle of my cooking pot, also made out of snare wire, so that I could hang my cook pot and cook from that. So that's what that little piece of wire that you're seeing there is. The trick was that I had to leave the shelter covered while I was working up the chimney, but then once I got to the top, of course, I had to peel back my roof and get that chimney pierced up and through the tarp. What that also meant was that I had to decide, do I cut the tarp or do I peel it back and work it around? But that means not having any tarp down on the far side of where that chimney comes through the shelter. That's what I did. I just peeled it back. And while I'm working on the roof part, you can really see the construction of my shelter. So I had rafters 
And then on top of the rafters, I had green boughs, which you can see here. And then on top of the green boughs, I heaped thick lichen and moss. Now this was for a couple of different reasons. One was of course for insulation, it was great. Two, because that tarp was so darn leaky, what I had to do was make sure that all of the holes were high spots. If they were in low spots and the water settled out, then they just drip, drip, drip like a lake. So I used lichen to push them up so they would be mountains so water would run away from all of the holes in there. Also, the pitch wasn't very much because that's just the space that I had to work with. So I built up more and more layers of lichen and moss towards the front side of the shelter to raise and make a steeper pitch down the roof so that the water would slant down the rock and off. The tricky part here was that I didn't have tarp for the part of the roof back behind the chimney. So I had to look all over and haul lots of flat, thin stones and lay them like shingles to sheet the water off that low part beneath the chimney. So it was a major, major project, very calorie intensive, a lot of energy, but having a chimney and being able to truly seal that shelter, definitely worth the effort. This is the first episode that we are starting to see the sea ice forming. So we see it with both Michelle and Callie in their first scenes. Really, really cool to see. That takes low temperatures, lower than what it takes to freeze lake water. So we see here Michelle talking about how recovering from alone is such a big deal. And she has to be really conscious out there of not pop putting her body through that level of trauma again. That is so present with all of us out there. We all know what being out here long term and pushing it hard actually does to us. And there is no way to not have that in your mind out there once you've been through it once before. That is why we are seeing such different attitudes and so much more struggle with folks on Frozen. A lot of viewers seem upset by that because they don't really get how different the experience is a second time. And a lot of people think, well, you know you did it okay the first time, so now you should be better at it and stronger the second time. But no, you're not naive anymore and you know exactly what it is doing to yourself. Whole different thing. And you often don't remember until you were out there again how hard it was on your body and the kind of trauma you went through. So wonderful seeing Michelle get that hair. Clearly it's her first hair because she is amazed and so excited about it. Love watching her get that and watching her really eat a big old pot of food and be so excited about it. Wow, hearing more about Amos's history as a young boy doing a hunger strike so that his mother would be released from prison camp where she was being tortured and beaten. Are you kidding me? This man's history, wow, it makes me love and respect Amos so much more because he is such a good man. He is kind and loving and fun and gentle and soft-spoken. He is such a good person. And it could have gone the other way for him. Going through that kind of trauma as a young person could have turned him into a bitter and angry and violent man, but it didn't. And that is because, as he talked about in earlier episodes, because he found his connection to nature early on, and that was his solace. That is where he went to. Just a plug for how healing it is to immerse yourself in nature and not just spend time there, but do it in ways like Amos has done, really empowering himself feeding himself, learning how to make and do from the land in the ways his ancestors and all of our ancestors did, that is another level of healing and personal growth and empowerment that comes through that. Clearly really hard on him to be comparing his last time with lots and lots of fish to this time with no fish, so hard to get fish. You're just seeing this over and over in every episode. We're not getting fish. We went out there thinking, oh, the bountiful waters of Labrador and Newfoundland, great fisheries, but not in that location and not at that time of year. Big wake up call for all of us. Just, oh, dang it. In the next scene with me, I am waking up recognizing that I'm already pretty skinny and it has not been that long that I've been out there. And this is a testament to how incredibly hard I was working out there. So this is where I wanna show you <laughs> The aerial pans of my location, as opposed to the aerial pans of the other ones. Every other spot, when you get that overhead footage, you see a long stretch of shoreline, and then you see all forest, and it looks fairly low level everywhere. 
you see my spot and you see one small beach and I think it was probably 60 to 80 feet long. At high tide, that beach was completely covered. The high tide line was at the very edge where the steep part started. So very little beach, no access any other time. And you can see there are little bits of forest here and there, very steep forest that you can see near the beach, and then all rock cliffs, all rock cliffs. And where my shelter is, it's not even remotely viewable in this pan. It is up higher and way further to the northeast from the area that we are seeing. So I was burning so many calories every time I went down to that beach and back up. You saw me hauling big, heavy pieces of lumber from that beach up, up, up hundreds of feet. Every time I was harvesting mussels, I was hauling rocks. So yeah, the weight was melting off of me. Now I was eating a fair amount of mussels early on, but mussels are very low fat and the number of calories I was expending hauling rock and armloads of lichen and moss and cutting what trees I could without having too much impact. It was tremendous. So the way I built that chimney was, you can see I had that flat area prepared. I built up two walls of stone and then the mantle on top of it. And then I started going back at a slight angle using the rock corner itself as the support for that chimney. It was a lot of careful rock work to make sure it was stable. I, I wedged in rocks and then worked into the wall, but I had to be very, very careful to make sure that it was both well supported and also so that I didn't have any wood exposed to the heat and the sparks from the chimney. So even when I got to where I was building up against the wall, I always had stones and then soil, mineral soil, not soil vegetation that could dry out and be flammable between it and the structure. And same when I actually pierced the roof, I did use some of those cross pieces that I put in to support the stones, but I made sure that those cross pieces, the wood was never exposed to the hot air and sparks going up the chimney. So lots of rocks and lots of soil. My first fire in that new chimney was such a ah moment, right? It was just glorious to have a fire right there with all of that stone to reflect its warmth back on me. And then having that little hook that was just perfect for hanging my pot. So awesome. So we now see Amos talking about how half of his hair fell out from season seven, and now he's wondering if the other half is gonna fall out. That is a common thing. It happens to most of us who go long-term, very underfed out there. That is a thing that your body does when it's not getting enough calories to maintain its vital symptoms. It starts shutting out the less vital. That is why a lot of issues with our teeth, because it stops giving the teeth the minerals, and in fact, it can take the minerals out of your teeth to keep your other functioning things going. Also, it basically just stops sending energy to your hair. So hair growth stops. And then eventually over time, where it was in the follicle, when it stopped growing, it's just going to fall out from that point. Also, a lot of your organs actually shrink in size. So your liver, your heart, and your brain still get a lot of your calories because those are so vital. It can't let them go. But a lot of your other less important organs start to shrink. Most women lose their periods out there if they're out for more than one cycle. Lots of physiological effects. And that is what Amos is going through. He's like, you know, I am eating a lot less than I ate last time and I do not want to go through what I went through last time. I know right now what the long-term effects every single day out here is going to have on my body. That's a lot to sit with. Love so many people saying on this season, I'm not out here to show how tough I am. You hear in the trailer with me saying, I'm not doing the season for a suffering contest. We've all already done it. We went out there to have all of the wonders of that experience again, but none of us want to put our bodies on the line again. And that's really important. And I really appreciate Amos talking about what an important example that is setting. We see Michelle harvesting that seagrass. Yeah, it's a trip. It's a totally different texture. It's really strong. It has almost a waxy texture. I think that's to protect it from the salty ocean. It's so strong that I got a lot of grass cuts, sometimes intense cuts. You can see in some of the footage, me having band-aids and some of that is from harvesting that seagrass. You really have to cut it with a knife because it is so hard just trying to grab it with your hands. It'll slice right through them. 
Michelle is talking about how much lonelier she is this season than before. Every single one of us clearly was experiencing that. We are all talking about home and our families a lot more. I was really having a hard time with it early on. The people with kids are really feeling it. Everyone is missing their people and every single one of us has talked about it a lot out there. I don't know why it's so different the first time and the second time, but that's clearly the universal experience. And you don't know that when you're out there, you're just thinking, geez, what is going on with me that this time feels so much harder? And then you start talking to people afterwards and you're like, oh my gosh, that's just how it works, obviously. And then we come to that scene with Amos when he is making a hard decision. And what he really brings up is it is not about the time out here. I could keep going with the time out here. It is about the time I know this is taken from my life afterwards, the recuperation and recovery time, and whether or not I'm going to be able to be a good contributing member of my family, a good parent. Am I going to be so weak and feeble that I can't hug my daughter when I get home? Those are real considerations. There's been so much critique of the people who have left this season before, especially those who came out within the first week. And I get it. A lot of people are like, well, for God's sake, you knew what you were signing up for. You knew how hard it was going to be. And now you're surprised. It feels important to say that you have no idea until you are out there what the effect it is going to have on you. And you can see that. All of these people went a long time in really difficult circumstances in their earlier seasons, and they are having psychological trauma come up that they had no idea was coming. No way to predict that. You just don't know until you're actually out there. So just keep that in mind, all of you who are giving these people a hard time. There's no way to know from the comfort of your couch what it's like to go out, put your body on the line, have it take a lot of time to recover from. Good year and a half to two years in my case. Lots of time for everybody else, clearly. And then to go back out there again and what it's like mentally, emotionally, physically to be like, oh my gosh, I had forgotten the hard parts, but wow, now it's all coming back in ways I was not prepared for. It's very real. And then after all of these episodes, seeing it in the previews, knowing it was coming, we see Callie getting so sick. It was not the seal fat that made her sick. It turns out it was the muscles. She could eat them at first, but we saw at the beginning of this episode her saying, I don't really want to eat these muscles, but I'm going to. Now, I digested the muscles fine, and my body never said, don't eat these muscles. It always said, oh my God, muscles, more muscles, amazing food. I want food. So the fact that she's starting to get that, mm, this isn't appetizing, but I'm going to make myself eat it. That's something to pay attention to. That's a sign of something coming. And sure enough, she pushes her body to do it and it does not go well. Way better to go a little hungry than to eat something your body doesn't want and get really ill. Ugh, vomiting like that terrible, just drains you so much. And you can just see how drawn her face is. And she was already looking skinny. So worried about her really hard to see her getting so sick and miserable out there to where it's hard to get herself up off of the wet ground in this cold, wet climate. Ugh, so sorry, Callie. It's so hard to see. Hope you can bring yourself around. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate you watching and all of your wonderful comments and questions. And I will see you for the next episode, episode six.